Hello, welcome back. Good morning, I guess. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time you watch this. Yesterday, for the lecture, I had you take notes, watch the lecture, respond to some questions. So hopefully with this format, you get pretty familiar with how to take successful notes. Again, I encourage you, get the book as quick as you can and mark it up. Just thoroughly notate in the book. I know it seems like something you're not supposed to do, but trust me, book buyers will still buy back a heavily used text. It's just really helpful to be able to um, remember it. So take thorough notes, be prepared to respond, and I may ask you some questions to pause the lecture and take notes on those questions. Also, for yesterday's response, I had you give me a little feedback how well that process went in terms of the way that the slides look, how the lectures go, if I'm doing something too fast, too slow, too much information. Let me know. I haven't had a chance to um, look back at those comments yet, but I will take those into consideration moving forward. So today we're talking about Chapter 3, which is Post-Impressionism. And you might ask, Dustin, why is it Post-Impressionism? Well, honestly, it's Post-Impressionism for no other better reason than it comes after Impressionism. And it's a pretty weak or lame definition or even kind of like um, way of defining a movement, but you can see how it's kind of problematic in that these artists that followed in the footsteps and in some ways were part of the Impressionist group started to do something different. And it wasn't until about 1910, so 20, 30 years after post-Impressionism begins that that label even takes shape. So in 1910, the critic Roger Fry started to refer to this work as post-impressionistic. So something done differently. And today we'll look at some of those things that define post-impressionism that are a little bit separate from impressionism. So one of the first artists that we can really say is an example of post-impressionism is this artist, George Seurat. And Seurat was an impressionist. He actually exhibited this painting was in the last independent salon that the Impressionists showed together. Monet had started that uh, with his painting uh, Sunrise Impression and uh, Sunset Impression, and that became the name, the, the uh, actually it's Sunrise, Impression Sunrise by Monet. Um, that became sort of the blueprint for what Impressionism was going to be. But now at the end of that, so this is the final Impressionist uh, exhibition, George Seurat is part of that. He's interested in doing something slightly different. So this is basically a second wave of younger artists that were influenced, in some cases taught by, or worked alongside the Impressionist artists, and they start to do something a little bit different. So what is that? What is that that's different? Well, with the case of Seurat, what he wanted to do was to create um, an emphasis on nature, but purely using color as an exploration of that. So he was heavily influenced by some of the science and color uh, phenomenology and some of the, the you know, theories that were coming out around this time uh, about how we perceive color and how color can have a certain response, uh, psychological response, even physical response, an impression that it makes. So the impressionists were really using bits of color to kind of make a kind of sketchiness related to the landscape. Most of their work was fairly uh, traditional in its genres. The subject matter a lot of times was landscapes, portraits, still life paintings, we see that continuing with some of the post-impressionists as well. Um, but here, Seurat is making, well, first of all, this is called Grand Jeté or Sunday afternoon on the island of Le Grand Jeté. And it was an island that's on the Seine River in Paris 
that people would pay to go to. So along this river on the outskirts of Paris, people would pay to go there and just hang out. So it's sort of a leisure activity on a Sunday, not working. And um, what we see is different archetypes. We see different people. Um, this is right here, probably a boater, someone that took them over on a boat. We see uh, what's known as a dandy here, this man who's kind of a voyeur or just likes to people watch. These um, women that are probably middle class trying to look a little bit more upper class with the style of dress. She's got her pet monkey here, her um, partner here. She is likely a prostitute. We can, we can tell that by the flower. Remember I mentioned that earlier. Um, and so there's a bunch of different classes that are mingling. Here's a family, a mom and her daughter. Um, pet monkey, kind of weird. Um, but what really Seurat is looking at is that, you know, his quote was that there are no lines or contours in nature. So why would we paint them? Why would we draw them? A lot of these artists started to move away. The impressionists started to move away from having to feel like they had to draw something first or that an emphasis on line. And here we see moving away from line. So this is really what he called pointillism, which we also call divisionism. And basically tiny little dots, and this is huge by the way, so this is a seven foot by 10 foot painting. If you wanna go see this, you could go to the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a great museum, world-class museum. Actually, a lot of pieces that we're gonna look at today are at the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, he was really looking at, so huge, you know, seven foot by 10 foot, but with teeny tiny little dots. Pointillism is akin to basically like how magazines and books are printed and how pixels work on computers, but this is obviously before both of those technologies existed. So he was basing his ideas on theories of other scientists, like Ogden Rude, for instance, and Chevrul. Uh, Eugene uh, Chevrul had discovered that when you place a color, like say a bluish green next to a blue, it looks more green or next to a green, it's gonna look more blue. So color in a way was subjective. So what Seurat did was he took that theory of color and magnified it so that um, colors would change based on the color that was next to it. He was so invested in this process and this idea of two colors side by side that you can see he even painted a little bit of a border along the frame itself because he felt like it would be too harsh to have uh, just this abrupt cutting off. So, you know, really thinking about the presentation of the art. And you can see what he's doing is a lot of complementary contrasting pairs. So this color, for instance, is mostly orange. He has mostly blue in the edge right there. Over here is uh, mostly green, and so it has red surrounding it, right? And he does that for each of these colors. So there's not a harsh kind of falling off point at the edge of the composition. This is all made of teeny tiny dots of little oranges and greens and yellows and blues and trying to create that effect because in reality all objects aren't necessarily always um, solid or showing a clear kind of outline as artists usually had shown it. But this is still based on a, an idea of kind of Italian Renaissance perspective as well. Look at the size of the figures and how they get back smaller as they go back into space. Kind of a sense of linear perspective as you go back um, into uh, space, it recedes, the colors change, and things get smaller. So Seurat is one of these first important post-impressionist artists. At the time, there was also, we had talked about um, from the last chapter, positivism. And positivism is based on this idea of truth or also, um, you know, that uh, progress is generally good. Well, artists during the post-impressionist period started to realize not all progress was good. We'll see that in the works of Seurat, we'll see it in the works of Toulouse-Lautrec, and we'll see it in the works of Paul Gauguin, who decided to completely remove himself from society. When we look at these figures, like I mentioned, they're archetypes, so they're kind of different figures that are interacting. So this painting is really forward thinking. It's kind of looking back to way, the way that things used to be, maybe before the Industrial Revolution, but it's also kind of looking forward to this kind of new idea of not quite a utopia, but how people from different classes in society can get together and coexist. And so it's kind of a new tradition, avant-garde, and also represents diversity, which is interesting too, diversity of classes here, different social status, not necessarily diversity of um, ethnicity. 
Um, even though Seurat was like the Impressionist and he exhibited with the Impressionist, uh, he did still favor drawing, and so he did a lot of drawings. He did a lot of preparatory sketches. Uh, and so even this painting here, Grand Jeté, he did numerous sketches, and you can actually Google, he's kind of funny because you look at him and it kind of feels like this painting post-pandemic where it would just be one figure because he kept using the same landscape and just focusing on one figure. So you can look up studies, Seurat studies of Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte. Uh, and it kind of looks like, uh, you know, us during quarantine, basically single figure as opposed to a lot of figures in the same space. So he did these studies to kind of think through how the composition would look. And even in his drawings, he follows that same quote or uh, mantra that he had, is that there's no lines, there's no contours in nature. So drawing shouldn't have. So instead, he uses this beautiful process of rubbing a Conte crayon, which is, if you've been in a drawing class, I know Ashlyn was in drawing class this past semester with Ian. If you draw with the tip of a pencil, you get a line. But if you draw with a Conte crayon like this, like you probably used in Ian's drawing class, you use like the side of it, you can kind of create more of an overall tonality or texture. And the harder you press, the darker it gets, like areas like this. And if you press very lightly, you still see the texture of the paper, uh, which has this really interesting effect similar. So the medium here is drawing, the medium here is painting, but there's a similarity in the technique, right? So that's the difference between medium and technique. Medium is what you're using, and technique is how you use it. So here we see there's a similarity in technique. Um, George Seurat, really interesting artist, very influential for what comes after Impressionism, or what we call post-Impressionism, also Neo-Impressionism. Probably the single most influential, not necessarily important, but single most influential artist of modern art and in post-impressionism is this artist, Paul Cezanne. Paul Cezanne influences everything that comes after it. You wouldn't have Picasso if it weren't for Cezanne, and you wouldn't have Cubism, because even him describing his work, he described it as creating a series of little cubes, which then influences George Brock and Picasso, who used his same color palette. This is just like Whistler said, art for art's sake, Paul Cezanne is saying paint for paint's sake. This is a painting about painting. What's really interesting is all of the artists kind of up till Cezanne are really still interested in giving a sense of depth, of space, of making it look illusionistic like this. So even though this is groundbreaking and avant-garde, it still fits within a certain expectation of tradition. And Paul Cezanne has a very famous quote. Sometimes people misinterpret, but the quote is, he was trying to find something solid like the art of the museums, the art of the old masters. So in searching, instead of positivism or searching out some empirical truth, he was trying to look at the world around him and create a reflection of what was going on in society. No longer we feel like positivism is always the case. Um, looking at other cultures, looking at other places in the world, colonialism is happening at this time period. There's a lot of abrupt changes. There are, um, uh, you know, protests and riots throughout Europe. There's a social uprising with people uh, being an, uh, anarchists. And so this kind of simple way of life is gone. And so he was trying to show a new reality. He's very influential. His work is very avant-garde. Looking at this painting today, I don't think we would necessarily see it as being avant-garde. It looks very picturesque and beautiful and idyllic. But at the time, it was very controversial because, and, and avant-garde, forward-thinking, because it doesn't matter if you're looking at the water, the mountains, the sky, or the house, you're reminded that you're looking at a painting. It's not supposed to look like a window out into the real world. It's about paint on the canvas. So one concept that I really want you to think about is um, what painters had been worried about. Even Impressionists were really interested in this idea of what's called local color. 
And local color means, so to define this, and I want you to write this down, local color means to paint something the way that it actually looks, which kind of makes sense, local color. Like if you're painting a red apple, yes, it's a red apple, but if it has uh, a light hitting in a certain way, it might look purplish in some spots, red in others, you know, almost gray in another area, but you're still painting the red of the apple. That's called local color. Now, what Paul Cezanne does is he starts to do something different, which we can see here, and that is called broken color. Broken color is where you're adding additional colors that is more uh, subjective, less um, worried about getting it right, and more worried about kind of creating an effect. So he was trying to create a, a more solid art, and I think you can really see that in his work. For instance, you can really see broken color right here in the middle of this lake, which is the bay here. This is the Bay of Marseille. You can see this red here. It doesn't make sense. There's some blue and some green in there, and the mountains back here are kind of a repetition of that color. There's some colors that don't necessarily make sense, which is different than this because, yes, you know, uh, Seurat was using purples and greens and reds in the dress here, but when you look at a distance at this, it makes sense of the actual local color. Paul Cezanne is moving away from that. Very influential for artists that came right after him, like Picasso, George Brock, and others. Uh, Milton Avery, uh, very influenced by his work. Even abstract artists later, like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko, couldn't have, wouldn't have existed if it weren't for Paul Cezanne. So that's why we say he's one of the most influential and I would, you know, dare to say the most influential artist of the modern art era, specifically uh, coming from the post-impressionist period too. You can see that ability to see things still. He's still trying to get it right, but he's searching for a new form. And I think it's beautiful because just like Whistler was saying, art for art's sake, he's making a painting that's all about painting. And he's still doing very traditional things. That last painting was a landscape. He does portraits. He does still lives, which are very, very traditional mediums. So that's kind of how it fits within the trajectory of art history. But he's doing something very, very new where he's kind of fumbling and searching for this new way of looking and seeing where it doesn't matter if he gets it right. So for instance, look at that bottle. The bottle's kind of leaning a little bit, right? It's at a slight angle. Or look at the table itself. This is one end of the table over here that doesn't match up with this end of the table here. You notice that? Which is also kind of then later influences Picasso and Cubism, where they get this idea of multiple perspectives of the same thing, kind of shifting space, because we don't always, uh, you know, really experience things from just one view. We might walk through a space or walk around a building, um, and that all informs how we are receiving it, perceiving it as, uh, um, you know, the audience. And so in a painting, Picasso was trying to show multiple viewpoints inserted on one uh, linear space. And in a way, Paul Cezanne beat him to the punch here. Um, you know, you can kind of sense that if Paul Cezanne's works defy gravity as well, like a critic at the time said, how are those apples staying in the basket and how are they staying on the table? Because they seem as if they could fall out of this basket the way that the basket's tipped. It almost feels like it's moving. I think is really beautiful about Cezanne's work and the way that I characterize it as it doesn't matter if he's painting a still life or a landscape, he's making everything mon monumental. In that way, I feel like a still life like this is like a landscape painting. Well, how is it like a landscape painting? This table starts to look like the ground that he was painting in this landscape, right? Very, very similar. Um, and, and the... Uh, wall back here is no longer a wall. It almost starts to look like sky, like space, like air um, going back into space. And so it really defies your expectation. And the, and the basket itself looks like a, a, a mountain almost, or this bread is stacked up just like stones or a rock. And so similar to this, like his landscapes look like still lifes, his still life look like landscapes. And he's really just trying to do that quote that he had of trying to make something solid like the art of the museums. And for him, it didn't make sense to make art that the Renaissance was making about, you know, religious art or allegorical art, or even work that came just before him with um, Monet and how Monet was looking at the landscape with water lilies and artists 
um, you know, that were trying to make things look exactly as they were. He's trying to create a new art that's worthwhile that would be on par with the artworks that are already in the museum, which I think just really interesting kind of uh, way of seeing his place in art history. Uh, he had a really difficult uh, career, though. He had uh, he was very socially awkward. He was very isolated, and um, did not uh, live to to see his own success manifest. It comes after. Uh, you know, like a lot of modern artists, um, it, it almost seems like they're appreciated more like Van Gogh after they have passed away. Um, but he was very influential in the ideas and the style that other artists that came after him. So another art movement at the same time that's part of post-impressionism is called symbolism. So one of the most famous symbolist artists is Odilon Redon, who is a French artist. And he was inspired by the French symbolist writers and also writers like Edgar Allan Poe, the poet Charles uh, Baudelaire. And you can see in this work, it's not as much about looking what's on the outside or what is going on in the real world. It's kind of creating a new reality. It's looking inside. So it's like interpreting dreams. It's interpreting um, you know, your feelings, your emotions, and being very imaginative. He moved away from doing painting with color, and most of his work is monochromatic, where he would do charcoal drawings, lithographs, etchings, black and white, because he felt like he could do things and take people on this imaginative journey that he can't do with color, but he could do with black and white to give it a kind of a more solidity. So monochromatic works, black and white, uh, this one in particular is based on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's writing, which obviously Poe was uh, uh, writing in English, but was translated in French by his symbolist poet friends. So he um, would interpret some of these visual aspects. Here we can see this plate that is floating on a hot air balloon that becomes this giant eyeball. Really imaginative, really creative, other sort of worldly. And he became known for these really imaginative kind of otherworldly interpretations. So he got the nickname, the Prince of Mysterious Dreams. Um, can you think of another art movement that is inspired by dreams? And I'll pause. What's another art movement that's inspired by dreams? Let you answer that. Surrealism. The surrealist artists were really influenced, you know, like 50 years later, were influenced by the symbolist artists like Ray Dawn and others. Another symbolist artist is the naive artist. He's an outside artist uh, known, known as kind of like self-taught. That's why he's na uh, naive or an outsider artist. But it's funny because he hung out with some of the impressionists. So he was seen as sort of an elder statesman when it came time for post-impressionism because he had actually... Um, exhibited with the Impressionists as part of that Society of Independent Artists. And uh, he had started first, he, he self-taught, he started first as a customs agent. And that was actually his nickname, these younger artists that started to pal around with him and started to find his work really, really interesting, nicknamed him the um, customs agent, which is literally what he was, but in French, the La Danier. Uh, and they didn't even necessarily know what he did, but that was just this kind of funny outsider status for them. It was like he's kind of pretending he's a painter, war painters, and he's kind of like coming from outside of that. So as a symbolist, his ideas were kind of um, out there and really inspired later artists. And we know this directly, like Picasso, like Salvador Dali. Picasso actually had a party where he had bought at a, like, a local thrift shop one of uh, Henry Rousseau's earlier works called Portrait of a Woman, this one right here. And he hosted this huge party, invited his friends in 1910 uh, to, um, or later than that, but this is the painting is from 1910, um, to, to, to come see this painting and kind of celebrate the life of Henri Rousseau. You probably know him more famously for his very famous piece called The Dream, which is very poetic. It's dreamlike, it's symbolic. And we see that here as well. A lot of his things are about the unconscious or the subconscious Freud ideas that later really influence um, 
the surrealist as well. So this one's called Sleeping Gypsy and this really kind of frightening scene, but painted in a, in a friendly way, this lion that comes to visit this woman who's fallen asleep. And you can almost imagine what the music sounds like that she would have been paying, uh, playing with this moonlit skyscape here. So it's kind of something that happens on the inside and different ways of interpreting um, how we view this. So this is symbolist art, which is also a part of post-impressionism. Um, this is interesting. This is um, August Rodin. And Rodin is interesting because I think a lot of times people look at his work and they can't quite place when it was created, right? This is late 19th century. I think sometimes people want to think it's much earlier. So this is Rodin and his work that was based on Michelangelo and other artists. Uh, but this is like, if you imagine like Seurat, a painter, roughly applying paint or Cezanne using broken color. Well, how do you translate post-impressionism into the medium of sculpture. And so part of that is the technique of, um, in this case, showing his hands, like modeling the form, leaving the impression of his thumb. And it's actually based on a sculpture by Michelangelo here called The Dying Slave. Uh, and a lot of Michelangelo's work was left unfinished. So he worked on this for three years. He never necessarily finished it. You can see the rough hewn rock around it. Um, and if you ever go to the Academy, the Florence Academy, where you go and see Michelangelo's David, um, along lining the hallway leading up to that beautiful, great sculpture, are these sculptures that Michelangelo made that are that were never finished, and they were um, slaves and prisoners, and you can still see them slightly emerging from the stone. Well, uh, that really influenced Rodin and in this idea of things being finished or not finished. So. Here we see this very graceful, elegant male figure, and a lot of times Rodin would study it, just like Cezanne is studying the landscape but trying to create this kind of new reality. He would ask his model to continue to move and pose different ways as he was working. So there's this sort of fluidity to the musculature, to the gesture, so it's not um, necessarily completely polished. There's still a little bit of texture, the thumbprint left in there, just like the brush strokes of Seurat or Van Gogh to represent post-impressionism as well, which I think is beautiful. Um, this, when it was exhibited in the salon, critics uh, were critical of it because they felt that he had cast, which at the time would have been taboo, cast from an actual model. So instead of sculpting it himself first out of clay or plaster and then making a bronze cast or mold from that, um, they thought that they may, he maybe just made a cast from a male figure. He had to defend himself and say, no, this is actually me looking at life instead of copying life. But that's interesting because later in modern art, in the 1950s and 1960s, artists start to actually do that cast from the body and it becomes much more accepted. But at the time of Rodin in the 1870s, that was not seen as acceptable. They wanted to be able to see the artist's hand. And in this case, um, Rodin really exaggerates that. So you can see the gesture, you can see the texture as he's like chiseling into the hammer. And, and a lot of his work, he intentionally left it unfinished, incomplete, almost like a sketch, like Monet would do with a painting, like impression sunrise. Uh, and, and you can see that in this piece as well. So this is a very famous, probably his best known piece. It's called the Gates of Hell. It's based on an earlier uh, series of doors from the Italian Renaissance created by Ghiberti called the Gates of Paradise that were on the Florence Baptistry that showed different um, aspects of the Old Testament. And here we see this is, instead of biblical, it's Dante's Inferno. This was never fully realized, though. It was a commission that he got for the Decorative Art Museum in Paris. Uh, and it was, uh, he got that commission in 1880. He continued to work on this piece for uh, almost 30 years, as you can tell by the date, 1880 to 1917. And ultimately was never installed in its original intended location. And he never completely finished it, but he really liked the idea of things staying, continually being able to work them and rework them. And actually he revisited these works quite a bit. Take a look at this. Does anything look familiar to you? What stands out to you? Does anything in these, there's these all of these figures that are falling into hell, these different levels of hell. And this is the gate as you enter into hell. 
Anything look familiar? Right here, probably his best known sculpture comes from this. The thinker was from this lintel, which this is post and lintel construction. It was common in the medieval times to put sculptures in the lintel. And here he has the thinker. So this is, these are doors on the scale of life size, but the thinker would have been smaller, about a foot tall. And, and here you see he's taken that on a bigger scale and he's made it larger than life. This was never fully finished until after he died. Um, and these thinker sculptures, similarly, he would make the cast for them. And then they, some of them were cast before he died and some were cast after. So it kind of diminishes the idea of the kind of the what we talked about the artistic genius of an artist like what they're doing is creative if you have multiple copies of something uh it sort of lessens the impact of just the true genius the originality in one piece um, but this is something that you know you look at this work and it's still an original rodin i think they have one at the cleveland museum of art uh you can see one of these pieces and see you know you're face to face with what Rodin did, his handiwork, his mark making, the process, the technique that it took to create this. It shouldn't matter that there's five copies, for instance, of these, right? And that some were created from his cast um, before he um, passed away and some were created after he, he passed away. He also had a studio assistant his studio assistant early on was the uh, artist Camille Claudel. And Camille Claudel, unfortunately, uh, never really achieved the level of fame that she deserved, quite honestly. Uh, she was a really uh, adept sculptor. She assisted uh, Rodin in making uh, his works and carving marbles. And he dedicated some of his works to her. Uh, but she died in pretty much obscurity. She actually lived in a, in a, in a mental hospital um, in the later part of her life. She never really had a prosperous, pro, um, prolific, or even lucrative career. It wasn't until like the 1970s and 1980s that people started to look back at the work that she actually produced. And now it's very much sought after. This piece is called The Waltz. It's similar to, and actually some of Rodin's artwork, like the Kiss, for instance, very famous sculpture, came from ideas of Camille Claudel. So it's, it's not appropriate, I think, to just label her as an assistant and a mistress. It's what art history for the longest time labeled her as. She was really Rodin's equal because she gave him inspiration for some of the projects like this inspired his sculpture called The Kiss. Uh, and, and actually he was able to sell those pieces. They were highly collectible. Uh, and, and she didn't get to appreciate that same fame in her lifetime, um, but now is seen as really kind of a prototypical feminist artist and uh, really important to, to see what she contributed uniquely to our history, separate from just considering her in connection with what she did with Rodin. She was also a symbolist artist as well, though, because you can see in her work where that dress that's beautifully draped off the figure and she's partially nude, partially dressed, the dress itself becomes kind of mysterious, almost like a wave, and becomes part of the rock-like form itself, which is something that you can see Rodin experimented with as well, that the material becomes part of the overall subject matter and, and the subject as well. Um, another really important post-impressionist artist is Paul Gauguin. Paul Gauguin was one of the first artists to really push away from this idea of broken color that the Impressionists did. So it's really, I think, unfitting a label to call him a post-impressionist. I think he's really more a um, proto-abstract um, artist or um, fits in better with the symbolist artist, although he was never considered part of the symbolist group. He's just labeled as a post-impressionist, just as Van Gogh is. Him and Van Gogh were friends. Paul Gauguin had uh, a pretty privileged upbringing. He became a banker. He raised a family. And then when the stock market crashed, he walked away from banking. He even says that he wanted to get away from his family and uh, leave his old uh, Christian traditional values and do something new. And so his his art and also his own lifestyle is really moving away from kind of a typical expectation of what it means to be part of the bourgeoisie in France. 
he um, so he moves at first. He wanted it so he could, there's this idea of primitivism, right? Primitivism starts around this time when you see people that are others that are living a more exotic lifestyle in another country, in another part of the globe, uh, like in Africa or in like Tahiti later where Paul Gauguin lives and moves to. But he wanted to get away from the hustle and the bustle of the city and what he thought was the evil morality of how society can corrupt the individual. So his idea with primitivism and others at the time was that if you were able to get away from modern society and return to a simpler lifestyle, that perhaps you would escape from the evil uh, morality of uh, the, the negative nature of, of humanity, right? So first he moves in France away from Paris to Breton, where these uh, groups of religious, almost like pilgrims lived, or, or um, you know, they were, they were living separate, uh, separatists uh, from society. He lived amongst them. He studied them. And you can see this. This is a painting that he did from, from living in the society called Vision After the Sermon. And this is Jacob here wrestling an angel, which um, he based on a Japanese print. Paul Gauguin is one of the first artists to really use color symbolically because this doesn't really make sense to have a red background. You can even see where the red is kind of like filling into the space of where green should be. This is a tree, this is a landscape. The whole thing should be blues and greens, but instead he imbues it with this really radical idea of red as symbolic for love, color, passion, uh, you know, um, anger, that, so that you can start to be thinking about the way that color is used as meaning as opposed to local color or what you see in the real world. So here are these kind of pilgrims that he's painting and uh, he's trying to show kind of a new reality. He was really inspired by medieval artwork as well. So trying to show like a new way of making art based on earlier art forms. And what he called this was um, synthetism, which is a synthesis. His idea is, is what he said was trying to marry the color and the use of form with the idea. So there's this sort of vision uh, or visionary quality in his art that the subject matter can become more subjective, right? through his hand as opposed to more objective, meaning just one thing. It's open for interpretation. It's this radical sense of space as well, kind of a flattened out space, but it really doesn't make sense. Like what's closest to us, what's furthest away? It's really ambiguous. It's kind of hard to see uh, what's going on. And I like this quote where he says, I shut my eyes in order to see. So he's trying to create a new reality. This is another painting that he did in that Breton uh, society that's kind of these uh, group, this group of pilgrims that's living separate from society. And this painting that he called Yellow Christ, it's imagining if Christ was actually there with those 19th century, um, you know, kind of monastic lifestyle that they're living separate from the world. And so it's a juxtaposition of kind of, you know, biblical ideas with modern separatist ideas. Uh, and then on the right, this is interesting because it, it kind of speaks to his experience of wanting to leave society completely. He later moves to the Polynesian Islands. He moves to French Tahiti, which is interesting because I think this is a bit of exploit, exploitation and maybe an unreal, unrealistic expectation of what he's going to find when he goes to, to Tahiti. He expects to find um, Tahitians you know, running around nude, living this completely primitive lifestyle, not corrupted by modern society, but colonialism is going on. So in Africa, in Tahiti, in the Polynesian uh, islands, they are being colonized by the British, Dutch, um, American, and French forces. And so when he goes to Tahiti, the women there are already clothed. They're already wearing these, um, you know, that the missionaries have given women clothes to dress to be more modest so it wasn't what he expected when he got there so he had to kind of recreate that it's interesting he actually used um some of the you know the early missionaries or early explorers who had gone to which they said they discovered uh you know tahiti or the polynesian islands they were already discovered earlier by australians aboriginals uh people the local indigenous people that were living there but he had to recreate their reality of what it looked like before 
colonizers arrived, right, before the French government was living there. And it, he felt like it was already a recreation of Paris, but in French Tahiti. So he looked at postcards, he looked at drawings that um, early explorers had drawn when they first arrived and what it looked like, and he did works like this. This is his, probably his best known piece, a really, really well known piece. He wanted this to be his epic. Actually, he decided uh, to um, kill himself. He, he wanted to die. He chose to die by suicide. He ultimately did not kill himself. He died of complications from syphilis. Living in Tahiti, he completely re removed himself from his family, from his Christian upbringing, which you can see here, too, with his self-portrait with this yellow Christ. It's like he's looking at his... He's kind of looking over his shoulder at where he came from, but he's leaning towards where he's going, which this is this oceanic um, ceramic mask vessel that's here. He's kind of moving away from where he came in those traditional um, Christian values and moving more to this kind of like um, idea of primitivism and escaping the evils of society. This is his famous piece. He, he said this was going to be like his suicide note. Um, he wanted to encapsulate all of his ideas about art and painting in this painting. And it's got a really lengthy, lengthy title. But as I read it, I want you to look from left to right as I read it and see if particular phrases catch different figures in as you move from left to right. Because he really wanted you to see this as a panoramic view of literally the title of kind of where we came from, okay? So the title is, and, and follow along from the left to right of the painting as I read this. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? That's the title. And you can literally see this as you go across, right? You see, where do we come from? You see this elderly woman here, juxtaposed with a duck, also thinking about the nature of where do we come from? This here, uh, right next to it, a younger. So you kind of see the striking contrast side by side, older woman, younger woman, a child here, again, surrounded by animals, being one with nature. Here we see this sort of oceanic uh, mythological um, goddess figure. So it's kind of a, a mimicking of um, Western modalities here. This looks very much like Mars reaching up in, in uh, the painting of uh, the birth or uh, Primavera by Botticelli. Uh, there's this kind of, it almost looks like Eve and a Adam and Eve, right? Um, but kind of comparing Western modalities to um, other world uh, part, you know, global modalities like Eastern modalities here with, um, you know, Polynesian uh, spirituality and religion. And then moving over to the right with the baby. Where are we going, right? So the far right, where are we going? Where do we go from here? Right. Um, if we know that the world, in a way, has an ability to corrupt us, what, what can we do besides just um, shutting ourselves off from the rest of society to better ourselves, to better other people? Um, this is a huge painting. It's monumental. It's about five feet tall by 12 and a half feet long. It's in the Museum of Fine Arts at Boston. Boom. Here's me in front of it. Um, and it's just a really elegant piece in terms of you know, that, that question of what is the purpose of life and what is the purpose of art? He's really asking that with this painting. And this was supposed to be his, this is like his swan song. This is his, like his, if he could write his own tombstone or if he could write his own elegy, this is what he would write. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Not just individually, but holistically too, in terms of humanity. Uh, and I think he was jaded later in life as well because he felt like he was going to get an experience in Tahiti that was already long gone. So this idea that escaping modern society, no matter where you go, it kind of still clings to you. Gauguin was iconoclastic. He wanted to shatter everything that came before. Um, he was good friends. He was also very cynical. He was good friends, though, with Van Gogh. They actually lived together. They were roommates. They had wanted to start an artist society, an artist colony together. Uh, Van Gogh was very difficult to get along with, though. Even though he was mostly um, very nice to others, he was very enthusiastic with other artists. He was also, as we know about his life, suffered from depression different periods of very, um, you know, difficult stress. 
and anxiety. Uh, we know he cut off part of his ear even while he was living with Gauguin to send to an unrequited lo love interest. Like, hey, fall in love. Like, that sounds like a good idea, right? Does that sound like a good idea? Like, oh, you don't love me? What if I prove that I love you by cutting off and sending you part of my ear? A lot of people say he cut off his whole ear. It's not true. It was just part of his ear. But he lived with Gauguin. They later, you know, break up. They couldn't get along well. Um, Gauguin goes on to sell a lot of art. Van Gogh really never does. Despite his brother being a art dealer and owning a gallery, uh, Van Gogh only sold one painting in his lifetime. His brother dies, he dies, uh, and his sister-in-law says, I'm going to make him famous. And within 10 years of him passing away, she does just that. Uh, we know he had a tortured, troubled kind of life, but we also know through his letters, he wrote his brother a three or four page letter almost every single day. And over the course of about three years, uh, he, he made, uh, you know, from about 1887 to 1890, he made close to a thousand works. He was very, very prolific. We're not quite sure. Like a lot of people will say he went to a mental asylum and that's where he died and that he died by suicide. We're not entirely sure. Um, there, there's a documentary about um, he was possibly murdered. You know, I don't necessarily follow that same uh, belief, but um, we're not, he wasn't in he wasn't in an insane asylum, right? That's 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 the, the bit of the mythology of his life. He may have been a tortured ge genius. He was kind of melancholic. He separated himself off later in life, but he was at that mental asylum because he was there because he suffered from uh, a neurological condition, had really bad epilepsy, so he couldn't live on his own anymore. And he did, you know, he wrote about, you know, ha having this really unstable kind of demeanor. Um, but he wrote, like I said, frequent, really long letters to his brother, Teo. They've been published. You can, they're like three volumes. They're each like this thick. Um, they're really interesting. I've read a lot of his letters. They talk a lot about his work and why he made it. So, for instance, this particular piece, The Night Cafe, which is one of his earlier works, he... Um, was trying to show this place where you would go if you had just murdered someone. <laughs> it's like this, this night cafe, this like very desperate scene. And this is the owner here, um, also wearing this kind of like white lab coat that lived uh, above here. Um, so, you know, have an apartment that lived above the cafe. It's this really unsettling. He said to his brother that he was trying to do something with color to make people feel anxious, which I think he was really successful, but also the floor itself looks like things could spill off, right? And kind of like slide towards us like that pool table. Uh, he talks to his brother. This is one of his letters to his brother, Teo. He said, today I am probably going to begin on the interior of the cafe where I have a room by gaslight. So here we have artificial light in the evening. It is what they call here a cafe de nuit staying open all night. Night prowlers can take refuge there when they have no money to pay for a lodging or are too drunk to be taking, taken in. And so really he wants us to think about this place and you start to see it as this really depressing place. And, and it kind of makes sense. These are people that don't can't pay to stay at an inn. So they're kind of maybe sleeping or taking a nap or drinking here. Uh, it doesn't look like a fun, jovial scene. It's really uh, tense. It's, it creates a sense of anxiety in it as well. There's an intensity to it. There's a certain loneliness. And I think you, when you, when we look at Van Gogh's work, we it's hard to separate out him as a persona and his work. I think here's me in front of the work, and this is in the museum uh, at Yale, uh, where I did a fellowship, so me posing in front of the Van Gogh. Small, right? When you look at it, it's a little smaller than you would anticipate, but uh, this is kind of part of the modern art shift as well. You think about it, Van Gogh's not selling a lot of paintings, wants to make a lot of paintings, though, and he does. He creates about a thousand works in, in just over three years. That's averaging like a piece a day, a painting, a drawing, a print every single day. Just astounding to think of the pace, the breakneck speed at which he was creating these masterpieces. But a lot of times he would paint over other paintings. His brother would send him materials because he was truly the definition of a starving artist. So that's why a lot of them are smaller too, um, because it makes sense. If you're trying to sell a painting, you're not going to make a huge work. Um, the smaller works will maybe pay for you to be able to make bigger works. 
um, if you compare it to Gauguin, could sell a lot of smaller works so that he could bankroll a big, huge piece like this. And he was more independently wealthy than um, Van Gogh was. Van Gogh really depended on the generosity of his brother and sister-in-law while he was alive. This is this monk-like portrait. He was really interested in kind of continuing the Dutch tradition of art as well. So if you think of artists like Rembrandt, he's continuing in that tradition, the Northern Renaissance. Uh, artists like Elbrecht Durer, the German artist. Um, so you can see that here. And he compared himself to a monk in this painting. And um, really thick, um, tactile uh, paint, impasto. So impasto means thickly apl applied paint. And just a kind of a somber, morose, melancholic feel to this particular painting. He did a lot of self-portraits. He did a lot of landscapes. Um, and he did portraits of people as well. And, he, and he's kind of brought a sensibility of kind of thinking about what's going on inside as much as what's going on outside. Now, this is probably his most famous piece, actually one of the most famous paintings of all time. This is in the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, there's something really uh, sleepless and restless about this, like the sort of unease, but there's also something very calm. What do you feel when you look at this painting? What does it make you think about? Does it seem peaceful? Does it seem noisy? I mean, you've got this village at night, this cypress tree in the front. He painted this. This is uh, while he's living in a, a, a mental health, a, a, a sane asylum, essentially, um, later on, close to his death. And I think it's as much a self-portrait as it is a portrait of this village. But we don't know exactly what's going on, but there's these kind of like undulating forms in the background. His application of color truly make this a masterpiece. What do you see? What, what do you notice about this? If you were to kind of describe the line, the shape, and the colors, and, and ultimately how does it make you feel looking at it? And remember, Van Gogh was really inspired by Millet, and Millet had that earlier starry night too. How would you compare the feeling, the mood that's evoked by Millet's Starry Night, completed in you know, 1849, uh, started in 1849, uh, continued in, until it finished in 1865, 20-some years later, boom, how does this painting make you feel? And at the time, it would have been so groundbreaking that nobody wanted to buy it. But now it seems so, I don't want to say typical, but expected. It's not as harsh. It's not as avant-garde or progressive. It's just accepted as a masterpiece and, and a beautiful piece. Um, a, a lot of people, uh, you know, flock to go see this in the MoMA. It's one of the best known pieces at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's very iconic, uh, one of Van Gogh's best known pieces. After that, there is an art movement called the um, Nabis. Nabis means profit. So this is a French art movement. That is, again, part of post-Impressionism. This is art um, a little bit after Van Gogh. And you can see kind of that emphasis of like Cezanne and like Gauguin and like Van Gogh, an emphasis on the flatness of the picture plane. There are two artists in this um, Navis uh, art movement. And what they're kind of dealing with is pre, um, you know, a, a pre-turning uh, uh, of the century, this pre-century tension. So in 1899, you have what's called fin de siècle, which means the end of the century. It's this movement. It's just kind of this philosophy, this general malaise or this general tension. If we've progressed so much shortly because of the Industrial Revolution and between like 1870 to 1890, the steam engine, um, buildings start to get a little bit bigger. Uh, population in Paris goes from, you know, a couple hundred thousand to like a, close to a million people. Where is this going to go next? There's this tension, there's this like sense of impending doom the further we evolve as a society. So that the profit uh, is this idea of like, how can we take this um, unease and try to make a more positive uh, spirit out of it, right? So the two artists that are synonymous with this are Edward Vular and um, uh, Pierre Bonnard. Uh, who um, did mostly, so it's interesting because Boulard lived mostly alone and he did portraits of his friends. He was 
kind of a recluse. He was a perpetual bachelor. But Pierre Bonaire uh, was uh, married. This is his wife. And throughout his career, he does portraits of her. She's in like every single one of his paintings almost, even if she's just like a tiny silhouette somewhere. Uh, but a lot of times she's nude. And here we see, and this painting is called Nude Against the Light, nudity for nudity's sake. It's not a sense of trying to make it into an allegory. It's just appreciating the female form. That's what Bonaire is doing and comparing it to the background. And this is what an apartment would have looked like at the day too, like very ornate, flowery wallpaper, uh, rugs that are very decorative, uh, you know, um, decorative furniture and bright colors, the light pouring in. This is a Paris um, scene one of his ideas um, is that th there's a sort of a positivity. We don't know what's going to happen next. And you kind of see this tension in these works. This is called Woman in Blue with Child by Roulard. We don't know what's going to happen next. So there's these interior safe haven, safe spaces inside. I'm kind of closing myself off from society. If you think about Paris and the time at the turn of the century, it was a dirty Kind of nasty place before they kind of opened it up uh, and so this is a place where I know I can be happy and have bright colors it's sort of the same idea as the Grand Jatte where people are escaping the city the dirty city to go to the I you know more idyllic landscape here um, by Syrah they're escaping the city and trying to get a retreat from it um, so we can see interior spaces at the same kind of idea with Nabis or the prophet. And um, there's a really unusual sense of space in this as well. It's kind of similar to Cezanne. Look at that bath that she's about to step into, which is really interesting down here in the lower left-hand corner. The bathtub should be tipped towards us like this. We should be seeing that more as a cylinder or a sphere, the sphere should go more to an ellipse. Instead, we're seeing it as a circle, like it's frontal. And then I love, this is just a really subtle thing, but look at how we see the figure twice. And in a way here, we're seeing her from behind. She's kind of anonymous. Same with this figure here as well. It's almost like seen from behind, the, the child and the mother are both anonymous. So it could be me. I could be feeling like I'm uh, on a safe retreat from the, the hustle and the bustle of the city. And here I'm taking refuge in the house. And I can imagine myself being this figure because I, I don't see her face, I don't know who it is. But here we see the figure twice. We see it behind here, no face, and we see it again in the mirror, no face, cut off. And here, looking like this Greco-Roman classical sculpture, which I think is just really, really brilliant and beautiful. And again, cut off. So kind of the naughty bits are hidden, just kind of covering her breasts here, so you barely see them. Here they're covered. She's covering herself here as well. She's applying a little bit of perfume right? So you can kind of imagine the quality of light, the sight, the sounds, the smells being in this, even kind of the sense of a bath or water, uh, the noise of water like pouring out into that. Uh, it's a really interesting sensory experience in the work of uh, this movement, which isn't too dissimilar from the symbolist movement or even post-impressionist movement. Um, the next artist that I want to talk about is the artist Toulouse-Lautrec. It's the last artist that we're going to talk about, and um, it's uh, he's he's a very quintessential post-impressionist artist. Uh, he's he was unlike a lot of the other artists. He was born of means. He was part of the aristocracy. Actually, um, there was so much inbreeding in his family that he was disabled as a result of complications from inbreeding, a uh, genetic uh, disease that weakened his bones. So he was in a wheelchair, and he would go and visit these spots like the Moulin Rouge. And um, these here are called flaneurs. They're dressed like flaneur. A flaneur, and, and Toulouse-Lautrec didn't really see himself as a flaneur. A flaneur would have been like this outside observer. Actually, Manet thought himself as a flaneur. Manet looked at the world as a casual observer, like a poet almost, and tried to show what he saw. So the expectation was that Toulouse-Lautrec was doing the same thing, that he was just objectively like Degas was or Manet was showing us what the world looks like. And this is 
not an upper class part of French society. This is the middle class going out, having a great time at the local bar, which was the Moulin Rouge, which I don't know if you've seen the movie, but Toulouse-Lautrec is depicted in the movie as being the one in the wheelchair. Um, it's a great film. This is also, you know, a really important spot in Paris and a very lively place. These are flaneurs. Flaneur is F-L-A-N-E-U-R. And it just means someone that's observing. They dressed a certain way. It's kind of like a hipster. These were the hipsters of the 1890s, right? So this is a person that wanted you to think about them a certain way based on their dress. They're not dressed like this guy. This guy's actually a dandy here. An artist would be more typically dressed like a dandy. Toulouse-Lautrec probably considered himself more a dandy than a flaneur. But a flaneur wanted to, you to think about them a certain way. This actually kind of even looks like Manet. Uh, this could be a self-portrait of Manet or a portrait of Manet right there. It's not. But um, you can see these people lined up. What strikes you about this particular painting? What do you notice? What do you focus on? I want you to jot down, you can pause this, but I want you to think about what it's like to be there. What kind of place is this? Is it a happy place? Is it a sad place? What's the conversation like? Is this, is this a place you want to go? Is this a place you feel comfortable at, you don't feel comfortable at? How do you feel about this, this painting? How did Toulouse-Lautrec do? And I'll pause it and let, or I'll have you pause it and write down just a short little response. How do you feel? in this space? Is it welcoming, happy, unhappy, scary, friendly, welcoming? How do you feel? Okay, jot down some thoughts. Pause it. Now what I want you to do is consider the way that this painting actually was intended. So Toulouse-Lautrec sold this painting and uh, the gallery that sold, you know, was holding on to it, trying to resell it for him, was having a tough time and so they decided to crop it. This is actually the way that the gallerist uh, felt that the painting would sell better. But it's not the way that the painting actually works uh, or actually is supposed to look. This is the way that Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec painted this work. And if you go and see it today at the Art Institute of Chicago, which we also saw the Grand Jatte Sunday afternoon, uh, painted by Seurat, uh, is at the Art Institute of Chicago, great museum, awesome place. Chicago's really, really cool. You should go check it out. Not too far, about a 10 hour drive, maybe nine hour drive, and you can go see the Art Institute of Chicago. Go see the bean, go get you a Chicago style hot dog. You'll love it, it's awesome, it's great. Um, but this is the way Toulouse Lautrec actually painted this work. And when he sold it, and then later when the gallery tried to resell it, they cut it, literally cut it, right where I'm making this line, right here. What the heck? Literally cut it here and here. Luckily, cooler heads prevailed and they someone saved these random pieces and because he didn't think it would sell, um, but they later reconstructed this painting and sewed it back together. So if you look close at the museum at, at the painting in the museum, you can see there's a subtle line all the way across where I drew that red line. Now I want you to pause this and compare it. How do you feel now? I think there's a similarity to what Van Gogh was doing, but I want you to pause this and write what was, in, in terms of your perspective, in, your, in terms of your opinion, what did Toulouse-Lautrec want us to actually see or feel being in this space? And I'm going to pause it, or I'm going to have you guys pause it and answer this question. Jot down, what did Toulouse-Lautrec want us to feel about this space? What did, us, what did he want us to feel about being there? What do you think? What do you think he wanted to do with this painting? I'll let you answer this and pause. So I think it's a really interesting juxtaposition of that figure that's really foreshortened close to our face, really in our face, and creates a really interesting tension. Some of the color, and this is unnatural lighting. Again, this is, uh, you know, artificial lighting gaslighting her face right here, echoing the colors in the background, but it completely changes the dynamic, the conversation, the tension 
the, the, the feeling that's evoked by this painting. It's a much different feeling entirely. Um, Toulouse-Lautrec is also really famous for his advertisements. So again, we're really fortunate that people, these were used as advertisements for places like the Moulin Rouge, where dancers like Jane Avril and this guy, La Goulier, who was the zombie, danced dances, and here he's doing his little, looks like he's doing the robot, like break dancing. That's literally how he danced. It was called the zombie. Um, and you can see in the background, someone dancing the can-can. He made these as advertisements. So these are lithographs. They are actually prints, but they were huge. They were like four foot by six foot. A lot of these are reproduced. I actually, uh, my wife and I have a reproduction of one of his um, uh, prints in, in our bathroom. It's really cool, very, very large. Um, but, but these were very well known for advertising what it was like to be at the Moulin Rouge or, you know, one of these different places. And it's the spirit of the place. And it actually, I feel like it makes you want to go there and find out what it's like to dance the can-can. If you've never seen the can-can, you should check it out. YouTube what the can-can dance looks like because they're actually is video footage of the turn of the century, right at the beginning of motion pictures of people dancing the can-can. It's pretty wild. It's these huge dresses that have an undergarment under them as well. So like um, the, the women would dance and kick up their legs and their dresses would spread out. Um, and it creates this huge scene basically, a spectacle. And it's kind of like um, you were there to see and to be seen. And beautiful lithographs. So lithography is a process of drawing on a stone. What is lithography? Well, you take a stone, and the basic premise is that oil and water don't mix. So things are either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, right? They're either um, loving, they love water, or they repel it, right? So um, you draw with a greasy substance on a stone, and each color would have been a different stone, you draw on there with a greasy crayon. You then etch it, but it's just kind of like a superficial etch. It doesn't really like make it sink down into the stone. But you've got that flat planographic surface. And then after you've etched it, basically what you can do is you sponge it with water. And the water loving areas like pool up the water and then the greasy areas repel the water. So then when you roll a roller across it, the Greasy ink only sticks to the greasy loving areas where the drawing was and get repelled by the water loving areas of the stone. So this is kind of this magic process and that's how Toulouse-Lautrec, I mean, he, he really popularizes and makes lithography famous. Um, and, and it becomes uh, really important to be able to make huge, big, huge prints that could be cheaply produced but are also very very colorful so we see this as art today but he wouldn't have really seen this as art he saw this as advertising almost like a graphic designer but he also did his paintings his paintings like this and they're both of the same subject matter the 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 sense of celebration that's happening at the moulin rouge which is a club moulin rouge means the red barn it's this red barn literally looks like a barn with a big windmill on top of it in the middle of paris where people want went and hung out so Check it out, Google or YouTube, uh, the Can Can Dance, and then check out the movie if you haven't seen it before, Moulin Rouge. Um, I'm gonna post a few questions for y'all to answer by midnight tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Peace. This is actually, on the, he, here's Toulouse-Lautrec uh, dressed as a dandy, as opposed to uh, Flaneur. And here's the actual Jane of Rill. This is a photograph of her with this very famous dress. And this is one of Toulouse-Lautrec's lithographs advertising the Moulin Rouge and this dancer, Jane of Rill. So, peace.